4,200 drops pretty quickly. And Christopher Heights, I am going to mention, has a little niche in which that when you run out of your funds, we transition you into a state bed GAFC program and you're not asked to leave. 60% of our residents are low income at Christopher Heights. They came on at market and they transitioned because they ran out of funds. Nothing changes. Their apartment doesn't change, their care doesn't change, nothing. Other assisted livings also have the same. So I'm not, I'm not here to just sell us. The bottom line is they do have the same. So as you go along, if you're interested, ask them, what happens if I run out of money? Some of them do have a percentage where they move you into that slot. Christopher Heights does 60% in Marlboro. So it's not so bad when you actually think of it that way. Now it's me. And thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, but she's gonna be back for questions. Yep. Um, to make it clear, if you're at assisted living, you can keep your car, right? So you're still driving and stuff, right? I know there was a mention of, well, because a lot of people don't, right? But you can, you can just keep your car. I think the description that you just got of the relationship between you and your kids was a really good one, right? That one of the nice things a lot of times about assisted living is that if your kids, well, not all of them, you know, there's always the ones that don't do anything, but let's say the designated daughter, inevitably there's a designated daughter, right, who's always the one that lives kind of close and does all the stuff and she's coming over, and you found that she's probably been doing a lot. Well, one of the nice things about assisted living is that you may be allowing your daughter to be your daughter again, and to not be the housekeeper and the cook and bottle washer and all the other stuff, right, which tends to, which kind of tends to start happening, right? Um, Regarding where to go for assisted living, as I said at the beginning, you really want to shop that. You know, you want to, now is a good time to go look at assisted livings before you go, right? Before there's an emergency, so that you can get a sense, first of all, if you like it in general, but secondly, if there's a special place. I think the, the, the thing I always compare this to is, I remember when my kids were going through looking for colleges, you know? And they look and they look and you go to like 10 schools and they were all charging a million dollars, you know? And they were all, they, they look good. You know, on paper they look similar. But inevitably, your, your child would come home from one and say, gee dad, that's, that's the one. I mean, I just felt right, that's the place for me. I think you find the same thing doing assisted living. You may find that there's one where you say, oh, that's the place for me. So, now let's talk about money. When you're doing this application, which is a written application for the benefit. Don't you don't necessarily want to have the first person you talk to be the person at the VA uh, in terms of how you're filling out this, pro this uh, the, uh, the application. You want to really be able to t tell somebody who's used to doing this stuff and make sure that you're describing what your medical issues are in ways that make sense as far as they're concerned. So don't assume that you don't need assistance with two of the activities of daily living until you've talked to somebody about it. Another example that I, that I heard Patty Surveys use was if you're in an assisted living facility and you have trouble eating your meat, you have trouble eating steak, and so somebody there needs to cut up the steak for you before you eat it. Well, that's actually assistance, assistance with eating, right? So don't assume that you know what the activities of daily living are. Remember, we're dealing in a big bureaucracy here, so you want to be talking to somebody who deals kind of with the bureaucrats. Um, the income test. So remember when we started, I, I gave you those numbers, those maximum numbers for what the maximum benefit is. And the purpose of that benefit is to get you up to those maximum numbers. In the case of a veteran, about a little over $2,000. But the question is, what is income? What is income? Because normally you think, well, you know, it's income. It's Frank, and, well, take Frank and Mary. It's Frank and Mary's, well, he's got Social Security and a pension. And she's got Social Security, so that's all income. And, and so the total of their income is $3,500. Because remember, he had $2,500 a month in income, and she had 1000 And you would think that's all income. 
Well, except that it's not for purposes of this benefit. Read the magic words. And by the way, whoever thought of this as, 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 as the magic words. Income minus regularly occurring unreimbursed medical expenses. Income minus regularly occurring unreimbursed medical expenses. What is that, right? Because when you're calculating income for purposes of this benefit, you subtract that. And what is significant as far as the assisted living facility is concerned is that if your doctor has said that you need to be in assisted living because you need assistance with two of the activities of daily living, right? And they are being provided in that, in that assisted living facility, then your assisted living expense is uh, a regularly occurring unreimbursed medical expense. So in, the, in her case, with her $4,200 unit, um, if Frank and Mary are making $3,500, right? You take 3,500, and I'm just going to. This is an example that we we were a general example, but I'm going to use her specific one. So you take your 3,500 and you subtract 4,200 from it, leaving you with negative 700 dollars a month in income. Uh, you can't go below zero, so that means your income is really zero for for VA purposes. Which means if you're a veteran, you're entitled to the entire $2,000 plus. Uh, monthly benefit. If you're the, the spouse of a, of a veteran, uh, or if you're the widow of a veteran, you're, you're, you're entitled to the maximum monthly benefit. So in Frank and Mary's case, uh, they would be getting the entire approximately $2,000 benefit. Now add that to their regular income of $3,500 a month, uh, and, you, and they, you end up that they really have income of about $5,500. So they end up having actually extra money, extra money, and being able to qualify for um, staying at Christopher Wright's. Um, the asset test. Uh, remember, so that's how the income piece works. And you can see now why so many people who are in assisted living facilities, right, are there because of the veteran's benefit in many cases, because that's the extra amount of money that allows them to afford it. There is an asset test. There are a lot of myths about the asset test. There is this myth, which I'll mention later, that you cannot have more than $80,000 in order to qualify for aid and attendance. That is incorrect. Um, what what the, the actual formula that the VA uses is they take the, uh, the amount of income that you have, they take your anticipated expenses over your life expectancy. They give you, they assign you a longevity number, how many years they think you're going to live. And then they compare that to what you have for savings. And they try to figure out whether or not you have enough savings uh, to last you until you die, given your current living situation. And if you, if, you, if you have more than that, then as far as they're concerned, you're over asset. But if not, not. So there have been, when I talked to uh, Patty Surveys, they have qualified a person with as much as $248,000 in cash or cash equivalent. So effectively, uh, Frank and Mary, we have about $300,000 in cash and cash equivalents, depending on how old they are and therefore how long, what their longevity is, may very well be able to keep all of the cash. Two other things, though, about the veteran's benefit. One, actually three. One, the house doesn't count. Your home does not count. So in Frank and Mary's case, that's their big asset. It doesn't count. Oh, but that doesn't make any sense, you would say, because you're leaving the home to go live in the assisted living facility doesn't make any difference. For VA purposes, the house doesn't count. So, as long now, if you sell the house, the cash counts, right? Because it's not a house anymore, now it's just a pile of cash. But as long as it's a house, it doesn't count. So to the extent that Frank and Mary decided that they wanted to make sure that they had a little more cash cushion when they were going to, the, to the, live in assisted living, they could probably get a line of credit on their house, get a line of credit loan on their house, knowing that to the extent that they ran through their cash, remember they had about 300,000 in cash, there was gonna be some more money available. And if you pull the money out of the line of credit, that's not income, that's simply borrowing money. So, so that it would not affect your eligibility as far as the assisted living facility was concerned. So, uh, the house doesn't count, one. Uh, two, 
Um, to the extent that Frank and Mary were short of money to pay the assisted living facility, they could always convert some of their, some of their cash into an income stream. They could buy an annuity. As a matter of fact, many of the scams, and there have been a lot of scams involving the aid and attendance benefit nationally, have been by uh, annuity salesmen. Who will be calling you, basically kept wanting to tell you about the veterans' benefit because what they really want to do is they want to sell you an annuity. And so what they'll tell you is, oh, well, you know, you can get this veterans' benefit except you can't have more than $80,000. Oh, look, you have $280,000. Let me sell you an annuity for $200,000. And by selling you an annuity, I'm going to convert your asset into an income stream. And as long as that income stream is calculated so that it's just right, so that the income stream together with the veterans benefit and your other cash is going to pay the, uh, the assisted living facility, well, you're better off. Now, all of that is true except the part about you could only have $80,000, right? So the, the, you, you can have more than that. That's the important thing. So you can buy an annuity, and sometimes that works. The other thing is, though, and this may not work for you, but you can give it away. Now, people say, oh, but isn't there a look-back period? Well, actually, no. There is no look-back period regarding the veteran's benefit. You can literally, if Frank and Mary wanted to, qualify right away and thought they had too much cash, they could give that money away to their children or to an irrevocable trust for the benefit of their children. They, would, they, they could not give it away to a trust from which they can still derive a benefit but they can otherwise just give it away one day and the next day qualify for the veterans benefit. Now, there has been discussion or there have been proposals before the Congress to impose a look back period on the veterans benefit, but as opposed to Medicaid and Medicaid, which in Massachusetts is called Mass Health, where there is a lot, there was a lot of story about, you know, welfare queens and people scamming the system and blah, blah, blah. And so that's why the look back period started being imposed. Um, when this got proposed in Congress, it went nowhere, probably because they were dealing with veterans, right? And no one's going to want to limit the veterans' benefit. So, so my sense is that that's not going to be changing anytime soon. So in Frank and Mary's case, if Frank was a veteran, um, or if Mary was a veteran, or if Frank was deceased and Mary needed to be in, in all of those cases, they could, have, they could qualify for the veterans' benefit. And the effect of that once again, going, going back to the example from Christopher Heights, um, would really be that Frank and Mary could be living at Christopher Heights, could actually have some extra money, um, and, and be living there for as long as they wanted. Right? Um, now, just one final thing. If you are trying to do any asset restructuring to qualify for the veterans benefit, you want to remember that if down the line you do need nursing home care, um, then the rules regarding ma mass health may apply to you. So if you've done these transfers out, it's less than five years later, and you need to go to a nursing home, there may be an issue there. That money may have to get returned. So you, you want to make sure that you've covered that base. Okay? One final thing. Um, in the course of dealing with Patty and dealing with the veterans' benefit, I learned something that I hadn't really realized, which is unrelated to today. Um, when you are dealing with nursing homes and trying to get through that five-year look-back period because you've transferred money out and it was only three years ago and for some reason now you need nursing home care and you realize the nursing home bed is $10,000 a month or $11,000 a month and your income is only $3,000 a month, well then you're, you, know, you or your kids are saying to themselves, boy, it's going to cost us a lot to get through these next two years so that we can make it past the five-year look-back period. Well, that those, the, the aid and attendance benefit applies to nursing homes. It will pay the nursing home, not while you're on Mass Health, but before you go on to Mass Health. So in Frank and Mary's case, their income is $3,500 a month. If they were in a nursing home bed, they could, with charging $10,000 a month, they could qualify for the entire aid and attendance benefit. So, they'd be, so their income would actually about, be about $5,500 a month. So the amount they'd be needing to use or burn from their savings would be very small. So that's a lot of information, and I think I think we're and so we're open for questions. Any questions from anybody? <laughs>